my name is Caitlin. I run a collective, a Berlin-based collective called Coquo, uh, and we are interested in addressing and perhaps changing status quos that we see uh, in the world, uh, and especially at the intersections of art, music, and technology. And I have been hosting for the last few weeks the Music Features and Simulacra series, uh, which is exploring the use of signs and symbols to imagine new futures for not just the music industry, but specifically, uh, I, I'm interested in a specifically music context. Um, and today we are here to talk about avatars, which I find uh, quite fascinating. Uh, I guess they've been around for sort of as long as the internet has been around and even longer. I was talking to somebody the other day and they kind of mentioned like Cindy Sherman, the photographer is like, proto avatar which I really like loved I hadn't thought about that before but um I guess avatar in like a, in a strictly digital sense kind of comes along or came along with the internet um and I think it can be something like as simple as like an MSN or AOL uh display picture or like something as like complex as the work that I see all of you do um so like I said rather than uh, have me describe all of your work, uh, maybe we could just, you could go around and talk about your work and sort of how it, how it relates to avatars and um, what, well, let's start with how it relates to avatars. Um, but Clippy, do you wanna go first? Okay, yeah, I'll do a, I'll do a little intro first. So um, again, there are two ways I can introduce myself. Um, hi there, my name is Clippy and I'm a pop musician based out of Nashville, Tennessee and I write pop music and it's like kind of aggressive. And I just put out my debut record called Consensual Hits. And also I'm releasing an eyeshadow palette that I made and it's really cool or something. Or I can uh, introduce myself as the artist behind Clippy, which is, hi, my name is AC Carter. I'm a multidisciplinary artist in the Southeast, and I'm interested in the intersections between music and art, and uh, I also explore gender identities. Cool, uh, thanks so much. Maybe I will throw to Stacy because Stacy is the one who introduced Clippy and I um, because of your work together. Um, but Stacy, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, hey everyone, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Stacy Ant, and I'm based out of Berlin. So yes, Kalupi and I are working on a music project at the moment. And it's actually so funny because I know that Clippy is your character name, but I've totally been calling you that in every message. I'm like, hey, Clippy, oh, no, that's hi. great. Hope you're that's, having a great day. <laughs> that's great. I love that. I would love to be. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's so funny and it really ties into this idea of your avatar. It's like, I'm working with this side of you. Like I'm working with this particular project that you're bringing to life. So I get to see Clippy as a character and I get to see you realize this character. And it's almost like method acting in some ways, you know, <laughs> like I'm really getting like a sense of this particular person rather than like maybe, well, as well as you as an artist behind the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like I, just a quick little summary, but what I do, I am a multimedia artist and a lot of my work, especially lately deals with characters. And I really like working with avatars. It's one of the main reasons I even wanted to do 3D animation is because I was just so drawn to like representing people in a digital space. So I'm really excited to still be doing that in different ways, whether it's through music videos or fashion or face filters, augmented reality, and, and so many other outlets. So yeah, that's like a little something in a nutshell. Cool, thanks, Stacey. Uh, Danielle, do you wanna go next? Hi, everyone. Um, I thought I'd use a little avatar <laughs> <laughs> to speak to all of you lot. Um, I love it. <laughs> um, so I am, <laughs> essentially an archival activist. What I do is I make uh, video games based on black trans people's experience. Um, and I essentially create uh, an avatar for everyone um, and try to archive them in a way that won't erase them. Um, and so these usually come out in the form of video games in which I make all the characters, all the music, all the scene, all the animation for. 
Um, but also we work collaboratively to like make sure that we're recording and archiving and imbuing these avatars with something of these um, actual real life people they're based on. Um, and so this scene around me is part, I'll just do a little dance, there you go. <laughs> um, this scene is a um, black trans play I'm doing, uh, which um, all the characters are actually, um, they're all the same figure, but each character is based uh, uh, on a different black trans person I'm actually working alongside with um, and talking to um, as part of the play. Amazing, thank you so much. I have no idea how you're even doing that right now. And I'm amazed, it's so cool. Like this, the, this is so amazing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really inspired by your work in, in the sort of relationship between the, the past and the present. Um, and I'd love to dig into that a bit longer or a bit more uh, in a bit, but uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and always. Trevor, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Trevor McVedries. I'm based in Los Angeles. I'm um, a software engineer and an artist. I've, I've made music for a very long time and kind of got back into software um, really through this startup that I run called Brud. Uh, we're trying to build like a modern Marvel or Disney. You might know some of our characters like little Michaela. The dream is to try to tell these stories that can now compete global narratives and try to create these scalable narratives and scalable characters that can interface with you know global issues, whether it be you know economic, climate, pandemic, whatever it is, and kind of out-compete these, these, these other narratives or dominating the headlines, whether they be Trump narratives or Kardashian narratives, whatever it is. And so really an exploration of storytelling and characters. Um, beyond that, I spend a lot of time in crypto and kind of think of like the emergent metaverse and you know crypto economies and how that's just gonna take shape. And so definitely interested and a big fan of everyone's work here. And so just excited to chat. Cool, thanks so much. I mean, before I forget to ask, I was thinking about this earlier, you know how like Lil Bow Wow was Lil Bow Wow and then he was Bow Wow? Is Michaela ever gonna like not be Lil Michaela? Michaela's 19 forever. So, you know, that's, that's going to be a good question. I think, you know, love it. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll shoot her a text and we'll see if she gets back, you know, but for <laughs> now, love Michaela. Yeah. For now, she's love Michaela. Um, well, thank you all um, so much for introducing yourselves and your work with avatars. Um, and I guess, sort of as like a, a starting point, I'm interested to know like what initially drew you to work with avatars and how did it allow you to elaborate on your ideas and your sort of like creative expression in a way that you felt you couldn't do digitally or or was there something else that drew you to it um stacy maybe you want to start yeah so um actually i was thinking about this question before uh we all met here and it's funny because i just remember even being a kid and playing games where you had to create an avatar even games like the sims or even before that and i would just make what i thought i would look like as an adult and i think that kind of triggered something in me where i was just so into this idea of like somebody's digital representation and it really started there and then I seriously pursued 3D after I graduated OCAD, which is the university that I went to in Toronto, because I no longer had access to the green screen studio, to all like the cameras, the equipment, and I was doing video art before. So I was like, why don't I just, you know, pursue 3D and then I don't need to worry about actors. Like, I'm just going to make my own actors. I'm just going to make my own set, my own world. Like I can make them do all kinds of stuff that's not humanly possible. And also um, just loving this idea of like, playing with representations, whether it's super exaggerated in order to make like, a political statement or maybe like a satirical kind of a humorous note. So that's really what pushed my passion for avatars, so to speak. Cool. Um, Clippy, have, had you worked with avatars before your like sort of work with Stacy, or sort of what drew you? I think so. So I went to I went to UGA and I got my master's in sculpture, and I was already making a variety of different characters that surrounded Clippy. Like I had one identity who was a fashion designer for Clippy, and I also had an identity. Uh, her name was Vixie Martine, and she was writing her thesis statement at university, or her thesis paper, or thesis in general, on Clippy. Um, and like some of her assets that I made for her were like an Instagram page and the actual paper that I uploaded to uh, academia.com. Um, so insofar as like working with avatars, 
it's felt very like sort of natural just because I've grown up with these sort of platforms like making different avatars like even when I was a kid there was this one platform I don't know if any of y'all heard about it but it was called my coke studios yes premise, oh my gosh oh my god okay great okay so great okay you know about my coke person. studios who knows it yeah of course it I was played like that as a kid <laughs> yes it was so funny it was so funny because you would go into these chat rooms, you build your avatar, you'd go into these chat rooms. And the premise of the game was like, not only to chat and meet up with people, but another part of it was you would create beats and instrumentals and then share those like as a DJ in those spaces. And so like, I'm in grade school writing probably better compositions than I did when I was like actually learning real music. Um, <laughs> and like sharing this with probably adults but like that was kind of the first place where I was like I get to share something that you know sure I'm doing this through this little computer graphic um and you know sort of untrue me a fictional me like in these spaces but then also being able to share something that I genuinely care about which was um at the time, like my little <laughs> doodle musics, but then now when I think of like me as Clippy, like I'm doing the same thing. I'm like able to share something that feels really genuine. That's so wicked. That sounds like an amazing platform and I, I wish it was still around. Or I would say it it is. Uh, it's not, I, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> uh, amazing, it sounds super cool. Um, Danielle, do you wanna talk about I mean it, I feel like your your artwork isn't like strictly avatar based it's very like digital archive based but how do you see those two things sort of relating right <laughs> yeah so um my kind of fascination with avatars began really with or like the digital really with when I played I don't know if any of you played this game Blade for the PS1 um, and it was the first time I saw like a black person in a digital space. Um, and so I was constantly asking myself, how did they do this? Like, how is that possible? How can you put Wesley Snipes into digital form and control him running around? Um, and so for me, when The Sims came out, that was kind of a, a through line of like, okay, there's something that I can do physically to represent those around me. Um, and then fast forward, I st had started to use uh, digital environments as a diary. Um, I wasn't very good at keeping a diary. I was a nerd, wouldn't be away from my computer. So essentially what I would do is uh, write some text out, put it in a 3D world and continually do that until it was kind of full. Um, and then when it was full, um, I kind of realized that this is the kind of world that I would like to put a character in um, that could then explore, or that could then represent these things. Cause I thought that I had laid a foundation that I hadn't seen before which was a foundation that I thought could support maybe like a black trans voice essentially. Um, and so from that point on, um, I would record um, and animate my friends around me. Um, so I would do like little bits of motion capture, but it actually just started with just green screening, green screening my friends into digital environments, putting them in, putting little halos over them, um, making them these demons. Uh, we were all these ridiculous demons. Um, I'm a huge fan of horror. So if anything seems creepy, it's on purpose. Um, and so from these uh, digital kind of scans of them, I guess, not scans, uh, 3D green screening them in, um, I then was like, right, I think I need to actually learn how to do the Wesley Snipes to make my, the people around me, 3D avatars, place them in that world, just so that there's someone that I know that's doing this for black trans people. Um, and then from there, it kind of became a huge project of every black trans person I meet, I want to archive them in the way that I have learned how to. Um, cause I actually don't know of a black trans archivist. And so this is the way for me to archive and record something about the black trans community that I know, um, and imbue them with like a sense of place, um, that they don't actually usually have outside of these, the 3d environments I create. I love that. I think it's so interesting to think about sort of like physical communities and then bringing that online in a way that's like you know, it's, it's taking up space. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, Trevor, do you want to talk about, I, I would love to hear about sort of like 
your like aha moment with Michaela when you were like, this is what we're going to do? I mean, it's interesting because it never really felt like an aha. I think similar a lot of folks here, you know, my journey into exploring identity and avatars started on the internet. Um, I was, I was really into computers, always have been, and was kind of on like IRC and hacker chats. And like, as a young, as a young person, didn't really think about how my race played in these things until I started seeing like racist stuff being thrown around with just seeing a bunch of like, you know, old white hacker dudes. And, you know, I, I feel like I hadn't seen like a black hacker person popularized uh, until like, you know, the seminal 90s like hackers or whatever, like Lord Nikon. And beyond that, I think, you know, I started thinking about how I could represent myself or kind of like present themes almost in kind of this disguised Trojan horse-ish way in these communities where you kind of push back against ideas and try to like shape narratives. Um, so that probably is where like all started, but I think beyond that, you know, I was really interested into like science fiction and characters and leveraging narratives to try to create social, social change, whether it was through, you know, comic books like X-Men or anything else. And I think as I've begun to explore as a, as, a, as a recording artist, you know, what it meant to be a professional figure and the kind of influence you could have on people, is to start thinking about like maybe their opportunities to, you know, express what it means to be a person of color or what it meant to be like othered in the Midwest, in the small town Midwest, maybe there are ways to tell those stories. And so that was kind of stuff that kind of trickled along. And then, you know, I was a big, a big fan of like Turbo Avedon and, you know, Hatsune Miku and people that were kind of exploring some of this stuff and challenging things. And, you know, ultimately, you know, working on pop music with pop acts, whether it was like Katy Perry or Kesha or anyone else, there was this kind of a, they were in a lot of ways like avatars, you know, there were opportunities for people to kind of like showcase their talents via these vehicles, but that, that, that you know, being a pop star to me can be quite corrosive, being a public figure can be quite difficult. And so there were always kind of opportunities and ideas that kind of melded into this one idea of like, maybe there's a place where we could create stories and scale and, and celebrities that scale like software. And if we could do that, what would that look like? And, and that was just, you know, you know, creating a bipedal, like, you know, photoreal human-esque character seemed quite easy on the surface. And then you start stumbling in and you're like, oh gosh, this is actually quite hard. And so you start learning a bit and having the right shaders and poke around. And all in all, I think it's just been this experience where I've got to meet a lot of really talented people along the way and, and kind of like push ideas off of them and, and kind of like, you know, take the best of all of our worlds and try to build it into this thing where we're building the bread. Cool, amazing. I, I was thinking, I was actually having a conversation with this the other day and it's so obvious to me why so many, I hadn't really thought about it before in like a, in a critical way, but why so many pop stars like don't use their real names um, because of course they're kind of like creating this like persona and Trevor, like you said, they're kind of like, like it, it's almost like an avatar, this sort of character building and like Clippy, do you, could, could you, could you speak to that a little bit? Like, did you feel like creating like a persona allowed you to like step into something creatively? Yeah, in some way, it's almost like, it's almost like you become the mascot for the music or like just the face of what, the face of what that persona represents um, or stands for. And like, I think of like, in even a critical way, it's kind of like a brand and a brand isn't just one person, but like a team, a team of people that are putting together something. But that's even like true for like any pop artist, like they have a number of different songwriters and who is doing the choreo and who's doing the music video and who's doing the lighting and who's doing like running the sound, like it's a huge team. And so like, you know, like Lady Gaga is like the face of Lady Gaga, but Lady Gaga also exists in all these different realms and is a team in and of itself. Um, which actually was like interesting to me. Like I actually learned about Michaela when I was in grad school because people were like, you need to look at this artist um, and how like, you know, like she's to me in a lot of ways, she's really genuine and is also backed by a team and like embodies a certain vision um, that is similar to somebody that's also backed by like uh, a flesh person, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. I think Trevor, I've heard you talk about this with like Michaela before that people sort of think that she's like being run by one person, but that it's actually like a huge, uh, like a, a huge team of people. Um, and this, this is something I'm, I'm really 
interested in because I've heard you talk about this before and I've seen sort of like critics of not not just Michaela but like the whole space in general that like in creating these sort of like avatars we're taking like work away from real people or we're like getting further away from like real life um which I think is like I think our like online and digital lives are just as like real as our physical lives um but yeah Trevor I've heard you talk about how you sort of see it as more of like a redistribution of work to like artists and thinkers rather than it just being focused on one person. Could you like talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to like Matt Dryhurst and Holly Hardin about this quite a bit. And this is like, you know, thin veil that we have in, in front of a lot of our you know popular figures or celebrities and this idea of kind of this like solo genius that I think actually it has been like, as, as presented more pushback than I would have imagined for like what we do. But ultimately you're absolutely right. Um, I often reference like uh, the Billie Eilish Vanity Fair video every year since she was 15. They like, uh, they, uh, and after a year they kind of film her and they talk to her like, who's the most famous person in your phone? And you know, how many followers do you have? And it's pretty, you know, to me, heartbreaking to see, you know, this is really kind of the best case scenario for the music business. You have this person and her brother making songs in their bedroom, having really outsized success, like headlining Coachella level success. And you can kind of see this person being crushed by the pressures of being a public figure. And so often, you know, I think about avatars as almost being like heat shields, these interme intermediaries between like talented people and this world that can feel, you know, pretty abrasive, especially in like, you know, uh, the kind of Twitter uh, panopticon, like, it, it, it can be quite difficult to create work and, and not have it ripped apart. And so all that is to say, like, absolutely, the dream for us is to say, is there a world where you can kind of have a couple created people and, and it creates a situation where one plus one equals three? You know, for us, we have stylists, we have engineers, we have artists, we have writers, we have people who otherwise wouldn't have kind of had this type of outsized success that can kind of share in the upside and, you know, create a, a living for themselves, making and doing the, the things that they love. So that's definitely one part of the dream and the vision. And I think it is always intriguing to me how much people would like to believe that this is kind of one person behind this one embodied thing. And I think it kind of speaks to the desire that we constantly have to somewhat be like the first through some of these doors or like to challenge people's ideas of what you know the future can be and how difficult it's for people to embrace and change. But yeah, that's largely been our experience. It's just trying to create value for interesting creative people via these, these avatars or via these embodied characters. Cool, yeah, I love that there, I love that idea of like collaboration behind this. In, in one way, it sort of like shields the, the idea of collaboration because Michaela or like any of the sort of characters that you work on are, are, are presented as just one thing. But I think almost for people, it's easier to see like, oh, of course there's not just like one Thing behind, like behind that there's it, it, it's more obvious whereas I think sometimes when you look at somebody like Katy Perry or Lady Gaga it's hard it's sometimes in a weird way harder to tell I think like what a, a production that is I don't know um but in terms of collaboration um Danielle I'm interested to know sort of do you do all of your like digital work yourself do you spend time um collaborate you obviously collaborate with um you know the the people in your life um, that you archive, um, but what sort of other type collaborations do you work on? Um, yeah, so I tend to do all of the digital work myself, not really out of choice, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> um, so usually how I build a team is, so I don't usually build a team based on skills. Um, I think something within like a digital fields uh, I usually work, in is that usually everyone is, is very skilled, which is amazing, but uh, the community that I'm a part of don't really have access to this or are going to school for this. Um, and they're the people I'm making the work for. Um, so when I build a team, I build a team out of people that have no idea to do with anything to do with games, digital avatars, uh, anything to do with digital world. Usually they're just people. Um, and so what I kind of offer is I'm offering the skills, I'm offering the, um, a way of doing it and they're just giving me their imagination um, and often we start with um, a question of what do you want to archive about yourself which is a really annoying question because everyone is usually like I have no idea why you're asking me that absolutely nothing and so we have to get the, the first thing we always talk about is um, why is it so hard to think of 
something about yourself that's important that someone else knows. Um, and then we talk about references like, okay, so like when Beyonce posts a picture of her baby, does that make you feel uplifted or not? And they're like, well, yeah, maybe. And they're like, well, then we're like, so what, what's about you that's so trivial that we can do the same and we can make something much bigger um, out of these tiny moments? So usually it's working with someone's small moment, which they thought was insignificant and blowing it up to an entire world, universe, song, um, interaction, a whole memorable uh, decision that happens within this, this game, this like game archive thing. Um, the, the one people I have to work with usually is coders. Uh, I'm not a coding person. I wish I was, but I can't really code. Um, and so usually I'm working alongside like one or two coders to try and like really get this vision done. Um, but the rest of the team it is always built from scratch, built from fresh. No one has any experience in anything, um, but that's perfect. Um, and something else that we do as well, um, which is funny, it's about the credits. Um, everyone who is part of the team gets to pick their own credit. I do not tell them what to credit themselves as. So if they wanted to credit themselves as lead artist, they're allowed to do that. Um, and so it's something, something weird about being in the art world is that often people are terrified of others stealing ideas. And so there, it's often like a hierarchy of credits, like I am the highest artist, you are someone I'm just inviting in as a workshop person. And what we do is we say, we level the playing field and say, you can say you're above me. You can all, all of you can say you're above me. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, what anyone else is doing. You get to pick exactly how you want people to credit you. If you want to pick out a name from a movie and say like, this is my role. Like I want to be deputy director, camera, actor, whatever. You can do that. You can make up a credit line. It, it doesn't matter to me because, um, the whole point of this crediting is also to kind of take the piss out of like how, how much people are terrified of um, the kind of work, like, and Trevor kind of mentioned it, like people think there's a single genius behind something where it isn't, it's a pool of knowledge, it's a pool of resources, it's a pool of passion. Um, and so we're kind of trying to do that and say like, we're gonna also show this passion in the credits in that everyone gets to choose exactly how basically high they wanna put themselves. And we support that. Yeah, there's something so interesting there, like to go back to what you were saying about how oftentimes you you see the people in your communities like don't have access to the, the same things um, that you see others have access to, but then in giving people this opportunity to sort of like credit themselves as whatever they, to, to step into whatever role they want to, like that is also giving them, like that's giving them access in a way. And I think that's such an interesting door to open um, and such a and such a creative way to, to open it actually rather than just saying like here are the tools to do here are x tools to do y job um, you're sort of saying like here here are, here's y job let's figure out how to like build x tools which I think is a really interesting I don't know if that what I just said made sense but in my head it did I, I think that's yeah. really basic. I, I would say like the only thing we offer cool. is yeah thank you a space we literally offer a space to do it because if you give if you give a bunch of random people a board and say design a game they'll design it <laughs> they'll, they'll find a way to design it um and then you can come in and be like this will work like this better but like they will be able to do it all they need is like some assistance in and that's what we offer that's that's so so cool um i guess to continue on this idea of like collaboration, Stacy and Clippy, um, I am sort of, I mean, I, I knew Stacy's work before, but I, like I said, I was introduced to Clippy, um, to your work through Stacy. So I'd love to, I know Clippy, you were briefly talking about how you both uh, met sort of like on the internet, but I'd love to hear more about sort of your collaborative process and how, I think sometimes it's the hardest thing to translate like your ideas to another person and to like, but then when they get it and they like deliver something that is like you're like you thought of it better than I could like I, I'd love to hear more about both of your like collaborative process yeah um oh gosh well I guess I reached out to Stacy again just via via the internet thanks to email had been following her work for a while thanks to a hashtag um and I felt like she would be able to understand where I was coming from when I, I pitched my idea of working on a music video 
i.e. an extended commercial for this eyeshadow palette that I made for this song. That's from my from my record. So I I just that's already a lot of things to tell somebody, be like, hey, you want to work with me? <laughs> Is this does this make sense to you? Um, and it felt like we were on the same page. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to work with Clippy because, um, well, first, uh, you know, before I agreed to work with somebody, I want to make sure that this would be a good fit for both of us because, you know, like when you're working with a musician, they're also an artist and they also have uh, like a strong vision of what they want most of the time. And I knew that with Clippy would be the case because you have such a strong visual aesthetic as well as, you know, catching music. So I think, yes, for me, it's always important that we kind of understand each other's vision. And I want to be sure that I'm the right person to like fulfill this person's vision, not fulfill their vision, but it's, I think I always see it as a collaboration, right? Like Clippy, mm -hmm. I'd like to think that you wanted to work with me because you also like my particular style rather than you just wanted somebody to do something in 3D. So like, it's always going to be like an artist collaboration. So I really want to make sure that, yeah, like, like I think that we really kind of understood each other and I understood like their music and kind of what they were all about, at least through the character Clippy, which yeah. is why I kept referring to you as that because I'm like, I'm like, okay, Clippy, it's like, I mean, I knew it wasn't your real name, but I just wanted to like really see this person because to me an avatar as well, as it's not just a representation. Like it's not like the digital version of a person. It's the idea of a person embodied in a digital space. So it's always, and actually Clippy and I have been making some decisions regarding the avatar based on that because we really have all of these tools at our disposal to really manipulate um, like the avatar and the set and also like juxtapose it with real footage and I just really love the idea like I love what they were all about and the idea of like this kind of a playful kitschy infomercial that we're gonna do so I knew that it would be a good match like, conceptually as well yeah and right. yeah definitely like working with somebody that like you you feel confident in being able to let go and just go do do your thing, literally do your thing. And I get to be a part of it. And I feel like that's a lot of really positive collaboration when you can really let other people uh, exercise their talents um, and just kind of be along with it. You know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, and I guess something you kind of just touched on there, Stacey, and I think something I kind of touched on earlier and something that we actually brought up last week, but um, this sort of idea, of, and it, it's not my idea, I sort of read about it in Legacy Russell's Glitch Feminism, which um, Trevor and Danielle, um, both of your work was featured in. Um, but uh, it is an amazing manifesto. If no one has read it, I cannot recommend you to like run out to the store and buy it faster um but this idea that you know loads of people say like IRL when they're or say like in real life when they're talking about sort of their life away from like the computer or their life like offline but then when you say in real life that entirely like discredits your online life and it's so interesting like how quickly I think we are to like use that sort of language but then like how and, and dismissive we can be with it, but like actually all the, like language is so important and the way we refer to like our lives online, offline, are they even different things anymore? Like I don't, can you truly be offline anymore? I'm not, I'm not sure, you know? Um, and I think, it, I, I really like what you said there, Stacey, that it's not like a, an avatar isn't a digital representation of a person. It's like the idea of a person, like it's just sort of like they're like, like an extension of them um and I think that that's really like amazing the work that like you Danielle and Trevor all do to sort of like bring that in like to to bring these sort of like ideas of people uh into digital space is amazing and I had sort of posed the question with the wording of like how do you feel or my next question, like, how do you feel uh, like digital life enhances physical life? Um, but I, I've kind of been thinking about it in a different way the last few days. It's like, how do you, 
how do you feel that like navigating digital space helps you navigate physical space? I think Danielle, you've kind of already raised a few um, sort of, you've, you've spoken about space both um, digitally and physically already today, but do you, do you have, like, could you talk a little bit about that, about how like navigating digital space helps you navigate physical space? Sure. Um, I think, uh, at least for me, when I'm, if I'm trying to map out a space that is built around me, say like a space that centers, I'll, I'll use my mum as an example. I usually, always use my mum. If I'm trying to think of a space that centers my mum and everything around her should center her within this digital world, um, it lets me know what I need to get my mom <laughs> in the real world. That's like just a really kind of basic example. Um, and that's kind of like what runs through everything that I think about. It's like um, when I'm doing these things in the digital world, yes, they're very like science fictional. Yes, they're like very fantastical, but just like science fiction, it lets you think about uh, the current situation you're in, the current kind of rules and regulations you're run by and what needs to change and how that change could be good and bad. Um, and so for me, it makes me navigate the world um, with those changes in mind. For example, when I go to meetings now, um, I always try and bring more black people than there are white people. Um, and I do that because in my world, that's, that is the case. Um, and so I, wanna, I want that to, my reality to reflect that. Um, and so I just bring people to my meetings just because um, their presence there, it means something to me. It means a lot to me. Um, and just small things like that, I, I think when I see what I need in a, in a virtual world or when someone tells me what they need in a virtual world, it kind of starts, we start to get on conversations around why we don't have those things and what necessarily are the stopping points from letting us have access to certain spaces, to, to hormones, to shopping, to um, traveling to Dubai, like to all of these things. Um, um, these all may sound really random, but they're actually like, there are things that like a lot of black trans people can't do. Like you, if you travel to Dubai and you're trans, you get sent back on the plane. So um, there's like a load of things that it lets us think about that we don't often have space to think about here. But also um, I think something that I love about digital spaces, in, and this is not just in my work, this is just digital spaces as a whole. It lets you center yourself for a moment, just for a, a moment in time. Um, and something that I love to do within my work is add choices and your identity into it. So you have to choose the identity at the beginning, then put your name in, and then the whole experience is catered to you, um, depending on what you choose and what you choose not to do. Um, so for me, I like that play between bringing in the choices of, that you've actually made with the real life outside of any digital space into a digital space for us to kind of judge you um, and for you to also judge yourself, I guess, nicely or evilly, you know. Not always so nice. Yeah, I really like that idea of it sort of being like reflexive and like responsive, um, mm. sort of digital, digital and physical space. Um, that makes a lot of a lot of sense to me. Um, Trevor, I'm interested to know your thoughts on this question because it it feels like at least the the sort of avatar work that I'm familiar with, you're not representing yourself, um, but you're sort of representing a self. Um, and how how does that representation of other selves sort of like help you navigate um, your everyday life or your physical life? Yeah, so I think for our project, we have this kind of collective identity. And like, I think oftentimes it's funny, you know, people will approach me or even like expect like my politics to be Michaela's politics or like my point of view to be Michaela's point of view. And they're very different, right? I think like the, the dream for our team is to take our like shared lived experiences and try to you know share them via, via allegory or via these narratives such that they inform a generation of young people as how they can approach the world um and, and i think you know in my experience just personally with the project it's been intriguing to see you know I, i've worked with like you know female gender pop acts in the past and originally with michaela we wanted to put michaela into the universe and kind of like let people project under whatever they wanted and when Michaela, it's clear that like Michaela was like being female gendered, people would take shots at the way she looked in a way that I never experienced as a public figure, you know, where they would just be like, you should change your eyebrows or like, you know, this is ugly. And, you know, in those moments, I think for, a, for like a moment, I felt what it might be like to be, you know, a female gendered person in the public, in the public eye. 
like no one ever told me to change my eyebrows because they were ugly or like you know took shots at me in those ways it was always like your snare sounds bad or something you know this is kind of like more technical thing and so I think there's like been plenty of learning for everyone on our team and I think what we again what we try to do is just try to share our stories via this character to mixed results like we've definitely fucked it up you know I think like we've tried to tell stories in spaces that weren't traditionally you know used for telling stories and as a result it probably pushed things too far sometimes but you know it, the dream is to like allow others to explore these spaces and tell stories such that like you know we can redefine what social means and, and kind of like play with this notion of this being this, this space being only for real things when and we all understand them to be kind of like fraudulent or kind of like I guess at the very least, um, you know, well manicured presentations of a life, not an authentic or kind of like real life. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I I'm I'm interested in like a lot of what you said there, but that makes a lot of sense to me that this uh, sort of I, I like the idea of like putting something out into the world and then allowing people to sort of like project on it what they want, but obviously that. It, it, it's kind of utopic to think that people are going to only project the best things. Um, and I guess, obviously, sometimes they, they weren't. Um, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> like, what could you talk about some of the other characters that you work with, like um, outside yeah. of Michaela? Sure, yeah. There's like Blanco Bermuda. There's this um, character named Daniel Kane, who's kind of like a, the evil bad guy who originally created Michaela. Um, you know, are, are the employees in our org are effectively characters? I think, you know, what we've always wanted to do is kind of invert, invert the traditional narrative process we're familiar with, especially in Los Angeles, of having this long form linear narrative, Star Wars, whatever it is, and then kind of atomizing it, turning it into a video game or a comic book all the way down to this lightsaber you can buy at Target or whatever it is. And instead say, can you start with this, 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 this individual character, still images, kind of work up that stack and, you know, in a transmedia way, work up that stack from these still images that are kind of disseminated across different social media platforms up into this kind of like interstitial or kind of like you know middle ground i would call like the press kind of like tmz layer you think of like kardashians is like the greatest storytellers of our times or whatever there's like this the social media layer and then there's kind of like press layer that's simplifying their interactions so that like a, a lay person can understand them and the most kind of like simplified or kind of condensed version would be like keeping up with the kardashians it's like linear television program just like running through the greatest hits of whatever that stuff was and so that's kind of like storytelling that we're trying to pursue. You know, our characters can go through like a, a, a romantic issue and then like write a song about it that lives on YouTube and then YouTube comment will be like, thumbs up if you know who this song's about. And it's referencing, you know, a breakup that went down on Instagram or whatever it is. So create connective tissue across these things is the dream. Yeah, that's, I, I also, I think, I think it might've been in the, the podcast you talked with uh, Matt and Holly's podcast, Interdependence, but this idea of like kayfabe as well, which I wasn't, I, I hadn't really heard that word before, but I love it. Obviously it like kind of specifically per, like pertains to like uh, WWE, like wrestling, but this idea of like presenting reality or presenting sort of fiction as if it's reality um, and the the response to that and I guess sort of what you mentioned there like people like sort of thumbs up if you know what this is in response to uh it's like in response to like a breakup that I guess I could say or any of us could say it didn't really happen but like if you created it on the internet then I I guess it I guess it did happen do you have like moments of that where you feel like you're you where you're creating things that didn't do you do you ever like kind of have to wrestle with that a little bit where you're like have we gone too far have we like created too much of a story and people are too involved in this now like do you have any examples of that when that's sort of like not been when, when you put something out and and something has sort of taken on a life of its own in like a, in a bad way i mean certainly i think like you know we, we like to explore the idea of parafiction this idea of you know telling fictional stories in places that have traditionally been reserved for like non-fiction stories, um, like social media, like Instagram, wherever else. Um, the kayfabe concept is one that like I'm a big fan of. It actually kind of stems, in my understanding, from like uh, carnival culture. You know, these people kind of like selling you and kind of presenting themselves to be one thing so they can kind of get you to play a game or whatever it is. And then obviously WWE's perfected it. Um, but, you know, for instance, early on, um, Michaela uh, in the narrative was like, best friends with this girl Alex and this, this guy Noah who are like friends of a lot of ours on the team in Los Angeles. And we ran with this narrative where like Noah broke Michaela's heart and Noah got death threats from the fans for like 
months, you know, and to the point where he had to like deactivate his Instagram. And he and like the fans, I think, were like very aware that it was scripted, but that was the fun, right? Like getting to participate in this in this game and you know, with like take the screenshots of them like telling Noah off and like send it to Michaela and be like, we got your back. And it, it like very much mirrors that of like any fan army you've ever seen. Um, you know, the beehive can be, can be vicious, or like, you know, little monsters can be vicious. And so something to be mindful of. I think you've already seen K-pop stands, you know, weaponized in political processes. And there's probably all kinds of futures where like, you know, these characters that can evoke emotion uh, are going to be weaponized. And so the things that like, you know, someone into that kind of stuff, you're just, you're just mindful of like the power of narrative and that like, you're going to weaponize this stuff and kind of use it to, to, to build a better reality and to think about both sides of the equation. Yeah, I guess like at its best, it's utopic. At its best, it's kind of dystopic and you're like, what is going on here? Uh, <laughs> Certainly, but... yeah. I mean, it's all Black mirror from a certain point of view, for sure. Yeah, for definitely. Um, I guess something that I feel like kind of all of your work, like explicitly, but also so like subtly touches on is like capitalism and commodification and you sort of it seems like I sort of see all of you use your um art or your work to critique that um and I I get I get like you're using your art and your work to critique that but then you're also sort of like making your livings off of this as well and do you ever like struggle with that like I guess sort of Trevor you just talked about ways that like things have been taken too far but um Danielle I'm interested to know sort of your relationship to like your work as uh like the commodity status of your work do you mean how I actually make money and survive <laughs> no like explicitly in that way but how do you like negotiate the, the like how do you negotiate the commodity status of your work with also like what you are like with the archive that you're trying to present you know everybody has to like yeah make a living um but mm. how do you negotiate that in your work yeah so so usually we don't sell anything there's nothing we sell we don't get money from adverts we don't get money from selling anything um that would be great but it's not really an option um so usually what um i negotiate is a fee, like a like a production fee, like I get a production fee, um, and then I use that to pay everyone involved. Um, every person who's involved, every black trans person is paid. Um, there's no one that's not. Um, and then the, the project's finished and it's put online for free. That's usually how it all works. Um, we're trying to make an archive, so the problem with archives now is that they're very inaccessible, um, very difficult to access. Um, you have to usually book an appointment and know exactly what you're looking for. And even then you might not get everything there because they might hide things from you. Um, and so we're essentially trying to make an archive that is very clearly made for black trans people, but also can be access accessible to anyone, which means we can't put any barriers of anything in the way. And um, at the same time, we can't, really trust or use like um, platforms like YouTube or, um, or Instagram or anything. Not because that it's not a big speech about how evil they are or anything, but it's that we don't, we want to have the code. We want to own the code. So we, we want to know when, if it's down, it's our fault, it's down. It's not someone else's fault. Um, and so we know the background terms and conditions of what's going on because our YouTube terms and conditions change so often and so do Instagrams that sometimes you put something up and they, they shadow ban it without you even knowing it. And so for us, the, the large important thing is that we own the database that it, it's run on so that we're not at risk of this erasure happening again to this archive. Um, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but I think when we're talking about commodifying and archiving, it's just something that's difficult to do um, in terms of like, we don't want to sell an archive. Yeah, no, that that totally answers the question. Um, and it, it was something that came up quite a lot last week. We were talking about like uh, NFTs and Web3. And obviously that's a huge sort of principle of Web3 is like not trusting platforms and realizing that, you know, if Instagram goes down tomorrow and that's your whole business, then uh, what, what do you do? And what do you make of that? And um, I guess this is kind of like an, uh, an off point but Trevor I'm super interested in like the work that you do with friends with benefits um and in like the web three space and how do you how do you see that like interacting with 
the like character work that Bread does. Like, is I, I know like Lil Michaela releases NFTs or has minted NFTs. Um, and like, do you do you see like Michaela like like could Michaela start a DAO or like how how do you and do you see ways that um sort of like avatars can or characters um can use um web three to 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 create new things uh, yeah almost certainly i think well um, you know so for those that aren't aware of Prime's benefits is this this tokenized community it's, it's a, a dao um which effectively is kind of a community and organization on chain um and what we do we're, we're a curation dao um the kind of simple mechanics behind it are we minted a million tokens and if you own 60 of them you can join this private discord and do other things you know there was like rfp for parties irl all kinds of other facets of what you can do with the tokens that you hold um but what i think is really interesting is that there are other communities one of them is, is called whale and it was started by um I, uh, a person called whale shark and so it's just like synonymous a person synonymous person who's built a dao around this synonymous identity and they've captured a ton of value I think that like, you know, one of the beauties of, of Web3 being, uh, you know, kind of your wallet being this, this identity that travels with you wherever you are is you can build reputation around this identity. And as a result, kind of like you establish communities and then create value around these identities that might not be linked to who you are IRL. Um, there are opportunities to do both, you know, like Terry Crews, the actor has a, a, a community built around what he has in, in Web3 as well. And so I think there's like tons of opportunity. I think beyond that, the most important thing for people here is that, you know, in Web3, the, the dream of selling media directly to a, to someone and having it be universally accessible is, is really compelling. Um, a lot of us have kind of like talked to, uh, I mean, different things I've, I've read from everyone here about the difficulties of like, you know, being a, a media artist and trying to make work and survive. And so I think that to me is at the root of what's most compelling for all of us as artists is you can make work, you can sell it, but at the same time, anyone around you can access it and when it wants to, you can access it. And so individual ownership with universal accessibility to me is like a really intriguing and compelling idea for the future. Yeah, cool, thank you. Um, Stacy. do you, uh, Stacey and Clippy, I'm interested to know, and again, this is a bit like divergent away from avatars, but I, I think not maybe as divergent as it seems at surface value, but um, your sort of like experience with like Web3 and NFTs, and obviously there's been like a, a massive boom and Stacey, I don't know, have have you minted anything yourself or like, is it something you're looking into or? Um, it's something that I'm kind of looking into. I have been in sort of NFT exhibitions, um, but it's something that I'm still kind of doing my research around. Like in theory, I really do like the idea of NFTs. I think it's great. It gives power to the artists. And I totally love the idea of, like, even if somebody owns it, it's still accessible and people can see it. I think that's really great. Um, but I mean, it's important to do your research about who you decide to mint your work with, because there's so many platforms and some are better than others. So, you know, it's just something I would encourage everyone to just kind of make sure that it's the right fit for you. So I'm still kind of in that process. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. Um, Danielle, are you involved with like web3 and nft stuff or what what are your thoughts on it um <laughs> so no not currently i'm not um because so the currently the only nft i want to do is they would have to buy the server too they would have to install the server in their house and they're responsible for keeping the server up and when the server dies the work dies and it's their fault um that's kind of what i want to do um i'm if it's, to be honest, it's a really interesting market, um, but I think it's too, this is a bit cheeky, but like, um, I think it's too easy for the people, for some of the people buying. And I'm not talking about like the regular me and you's, I'm talking about like the big ass people who are just investing in these NFTs, um, buying up these, like spending millions of pounds on these NFTs um, and these server farms, just keeping this work alive for them, this contract alive. Um, and I'd love for them to, <laughs> to kind of like take responsibility for those servers too, and actually take them and maybe use them as, um, I, I spoke to someone called DeForest about this, and use them as heaters in their home, or I just are responsible for the actual longevity of the artwork or of the piece, because something that differs between 
when you buy a physical artwork is that you're responsible for the upkeep of the artwork. Essentially, if you let it degrade in your home, you've let it degrade. And I want that same responsibility with NFTs in that it's not up to some random person running a server farm, it's actually up to the person who bought it to make sure that server is cleaned, make sure that server is running okay, make sure that service energy um, will be able to run and also pay for that server to run. Um, and so that's kind of my way of seeing it. I, maybe I'm coming out from a, to a bit to an uh, perspective, but I just, I just love the idea of um, a curator buying an NFT and being like, oh, that was great. And then reading through the contract and getting a server delivered to their house. And it's like, well, you've got to keep this running for 60 years. And if you don't, you've got to give me all the money back. That's kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah, I, I really like that idea. I hadn't thought of that before. Is like when you buy like a, a painting, there's obviously loads of like, expenses and like responsibility that go into like maintaining that um and I, I hadn't really thought about this idea of like when you buy an nft you're sort of like oh well i bought it um and but it kind of like i guess like negates responsibility uh, inherently and I, I'll, I'll be interested to see hopefully the way that changes and uh, i think what yeah. you've proposed is really interesting some artists are already like sending people pcs that have like uh, the nft on it so they have to use that particular pc to view it um which i think is an interesting way of doing it of like controlling the environment the work is viewed in um because i really like that i like that idea um but I would love to see it just go pushed further, like someone's like, you're going to give me your house for this NFT or something. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, Clippy, are you involved in like Web3 NFT stuff or? Um, you know, it's really, all that stuff is really new to me. Uh, it's funny, I used to, when I was painting a lot before, so I used to be a visual artist, like specifically, I was like, I'm gonna go do painting. That's what I wanna do. Like was pursuing that. I was like, I'm gonna go to grad school, do painting. At the same time, while I was making like these five by five feet paintings, I was also making a lot of digital work and going, I don't know what I'm doing this for. There's no, I feel like there's value in it because I can send any of my friends can view this artwork as a wallpaper for their phone. And that for me was like a political gesture and something like that was going against capitalism in like the infrastructure of being like, fuck, I don't need, we don't need to be like living our lives dedicated to like trading through, you know, this money currency shit. So forwarding to now, since I have mostly been dedicating all of my visual work in relation to Clippy and and my identity, I haven't, I don't know how it fits into a musical world. Um, if any of y'all know, uh, I was watching actually last week, part of with like Zola Jesus and stuff and trying to understand like, what exactly was maybe she selling? Is it like music clips? Is it like jingles? Cause if it's like jingles, I'm totally hundred percent game. Like I wanna write some jingles uh, and mint those. But I'm just I'm I'm actually curious to know like more of how NFTs are like what's the intersection? But that's not just visual or video or 3D animation, but how does that fit with music? Um, and that's something I haven't been able to to know yet. Um, most of the digital work I've been making right now are like gifts. I've been making a bunch of gifts that you can even like put on Instagram. If you search Clippy, you'll see like Clippy gifts. Um, but that's, that's, that's as far as I've gotten NFT ish right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not to like divert into this too much, but I guess we have a bit of time, mm -hmm. but like, uh, I am interested Trevor to know, cause you bought the, the Jack Green, uh, NFT, right. And that like has publishing rights associated to it, not on chain, but maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Yes. I bought that Jack Green NFT, um, kind of an exercise in trying to connect like off-chain and on-chain activity and, and, and kind of like speaking to like value that can be created in traditional IP and value that can be created via these like uh, new markets around non-fungible tokens. Uh, I actually think, kind of speaking to Clippy's uh, a, a question, there's lots of interesting value to be captured by folks kind of around works that wouldn't have traditionally uh, been monetizable and like traditional like you know, culture industry. So, um, you know, David Redding's talked a lot about poetry and I agree. 
Um, I actually think that like, um, if any of you ever used MSN or AOL Instant Messenger or iChat or any of those things back in the day, when you set an away message, a lot of people would use like a, a lyric from a song. Um, I think it's been tough for people to kind of like monetize a lyric. Um, and so if, if there's a world where like these popular cultural moments are capturing, uh, you know, as much attention and are part of this cultural zeitgeist, there are probably people that value them and like kind of like speculate and like own those moments. And so there's a world where like a lyric from a song could be quite valuable. Um, there are absolutely worlds where like gifts, you know, the, the Drake hotline bling dance, you know, like that probably is worth tens of millions of dollars. I mean, like, how do you monetize that? Or how do you, how do you kind of like, how do you appraise that? Um, that's kind of what these, these markets enable and unlock. But it's definitely like, you know, ups and downs to that equation. But I, it is intriguing for me to people to say, hey, I'm a poet and I create this work and I've actually struggled to create value for it or, or create like, you know, uh, to pay rent from it outside of publishing a book once every couple of years. Is there a world where I can do that? I think that's going to, there's going to be more and more of that to come. I think the dancing robots with like Doge dogs and Elon's head thing is like the tip of the spear and quite a boring one. Interesting stuff to to come. Yeah, I think, uh, and, and this was something I kind of mentioned earlier that I'd love to get into a little bit more now, but that like relationship of like the, I think now we're sort of like getting into this idea of like the the past and the future and how do we like archive the past and how do we like how do we how do we value these moments whether that's like monetarily or non-monetarily culturally socially psychologically um and Danielle I know like your work sort of really deals with this sort of like archival past and like imagined future and and how do you see the or like archive of the present not even just the past and how do you see those two things relating like how do you use the like current and the past to um draw a line through to the future um whew, what question um so usually uh i how do i start this I guess like with the past, I usually look at gaps. Um, I usually look at absences um, of what's not there. So for example, um, the only kind of black trans um, proof of anyone that existed that is black and trans, I should say, um, are usually like third hand, second hand accounts um, of someone and usually are warnings or hold some violence within the way that the archive, for example, there's this um, person called um, Mary Jones, um, who was in 1836, and she was a black trans woman. And the only thing that exists of her are the court recordings when she was being sued and um, a poster warning you away from her, calling her the man monster. Um, and so when I look at the past uh, and I see these traces of black trans ancestry um, with the same violence that we're kind of experiencing today. I usually try and think of um, a method to archive and record black trans people presently um, that doesn't re recreate that violence that um, archiving has done. Um, so usually this is, I mean, it's super simple, just very first hand accounts, giving people the opportunity to say what they wanna say, um, putting them in a room, setting them down, giving them money and saying, we need to talk about your life. Um, cause to be honest, it's not, what I'm doing is not very complicated. What I'm doing, the backbones of it, it's not hard. It's not complicated. It's just, I'm just listening to black trans people every day, all day and trying to make things around that, that center those conversations. I guess it's that we, because we haven't been given an opportunity to do this in the past, usually what comes out is something that not everyone is used to seeing or an aesthetic that doesn't quite make sense because this is one of the first times we're doing it. Like I've never been given this opportunity. Um, and so when we're making this opportunity, it's something that comes out that's usually doesn't fit into any kind of box very neatly. Um, and so I think that's kind of how we have to do these things. We have to kind of look towards leaving markers in, the, in our presence so that future generations of black trans people can look back and say, oh, there was this black trans game made in uh, 20, 2020. That's shit now. We can do a much better one now. I'm going to create 15 avatars of myself and put them on, let's call it black talk. Um, and <laughs> kind of like, I'm ba basically uh, just trying to leave a lineage of something, leave a lineage of something that centers black trans people so that those in the future can look back and say, ah, there's something that I can look back to and learn from and do better. Because I think what we're doing now 
in a couple of years will just be seen as rubbish um, and people will do a hundred thousand times better and that's great. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so hopeful. And I think especially in like the sort of current moment, hope is like a, a something that we could all use. Um, so thank you for that answer. Um, I am going to jump to a question that has come in for Trevor. Um, how do you keep the story of your avatars and characters consistent when entering new media? Do you have something like a biography for each character and the stylists and engineers have to work off of that bio? Yes, we have a character Bible. Um, Nicole and our team has all the, the kind of creative stuff now and we have these pretty robust character Bibles and, and, and team meetings to kind of talk through a lot of these things. Um, it's this kind of ever evolving document though. Things change, personalities change, world changes and we try to respond accordingly. Um, yeah, not probably entirely dissimilar from what they have at like a, a Disney or Marvel or anywhere else. And sometimes you got to call them the super fans to answer some things, but we try to be, try to document our things as well as possible. Nice. Um, Stacy, do you have any like recurring characters that you come back to or do you, are you kind of sort of always creating something new with your work? I do have recurring characters actually. Um, and when I first started doing 3D, I kind of created these few characters. There was maybe like three or four, and then I would just reuse them in different scenarios. And um, then I have characters that sort of evolve because as I mentioned before, like a lot of the avatars that I make, like they're kind of a representation of an idea rather than a lookalike of a person. So I would create a character who kind of embodies maybe like a certain stereotype or a certain uh like yeah archetype of like a person that I would want to I don't know explore and um and then I would kind of like they evolve with my work like sometimes you see them in different stories and in different scenarios and they kind of become more abstract but in some ways like whether it's through dialogue or through like really ridiculous exaggerated fashion they kind of represent an idea of a person rather than like somebody who it's based off of and I also I I do have a avatar of myself which I like to use sometimes um also like in my personal narratives because yeah like I don't really necessarily like to be in photos or like present myself personally on social media so I kind of do it through an avatar and once again like it's sort of a version of myself and I use it as kind of a buffer maybe between me and the, the online world, but also sometimes I almost like explore certain, like, I don't want to say traumas because it's never like really, like my work is pretty lighthearted a lot of the time on the surface, but like, yeah, I just kind of use this character of myself as a way to process life in general. Yeah, I was talking about this recently about how, and I, uh, I, I think you were sort of talking about it, Trevor, too, like sort of this, like, sometimes you can use like an, a, an avatar or a character as like a heat wall um, to uh, sort of explore and dig into other, other things. Um, I guess this is kind of one of my last questions, but it's kind of double barreled that I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on it. Um, but like, you've all been using avatars for your work or in your work um, for quite a, a while now. And I think, especially over the last like 18 months in light of the like ongoing global pandemic, um, people have been using avatars sort of like increasingly and exponentially, you know, like I saw, I, I guess it was almost a year ago now, like Lil Nas X did like an avatar concert um, and like sold collectible items to all of his fans who were there. And like, that was quite a, felt like quite a, like a mainstream show of, uh, avatar expression especially in in music and I'd love to sort of hear how you have all um like seen things change um and sort of like where do you where do you see them going where do you where do you hope that it goes um Clippy maybe you want to start on this one yeah so yeah the last year and a half we've all definitely been existing online much more presently. And I think there've been a lot of opportunities to allow performers to be able to keep doing the live performance. I will say there's something different, um, at least with the technology that we have right now, there's still a separation um, from the IRL, the real, the reality, I'm in physical space, I'm at the concert um, experience, being both the performer and the audience member that 
I've missed, but I do like looking forward. I do imagine like seeing like VR headsets being more accessible and like being able to totally immerse yourself in some sort of environment where it feels and will be like more genuine, even like facial recognition. Um, and with that, what I would hope and please somebody tell me if there's already some artists already developing this, but like in all those, the older, like the Sims or even the My Coke studios, like there was always like, all right, the first choice was like pig girl or boy. And then it goes on to like where exactly you are for the rest of your identity. And like, I'm non-binary, so I don't really fit. <laughs> I'm like, all right, so uh, I pick which one. And it would be so much more exciting to me if you just chose like human and like, or like there wasn't even the question. It was just like, oh, put your body however you want from the broad spectrum of all the different bodies out there in the world. And that'd be like the avatar that I would go to the show in, especially when we already exist online and that's how we present ourselves to the world. So that's what I'd be hoping is there'd be platforms that would just not even ask that question anymore, but then you'd be able to create your character, your personhood in a more genuine way that's not so delineated. Yeah, I think I, I would also hope that it goes that way. And I think I'm seeing it kind of go that way. But, and I was thinking about this, like not that long ago, I was on, do, do you remember that app that like everyone was obsessed with Facetune a few years ago, like where you could like make yourself look old? Um, but it was really interesting. Like it wasn't just selecting age, you like had to select gender. And if you, or it would like try and detect gender in your face. And like, it was interesting with me and some of my friends, it would like mis misgender people. Um, and in a way that sometimes we were laughing at and sometimes we, we weren't. And I think it will be interesting to see the ways that like technology um, c catches up with that. Um, and I, I hope that it does. Um, yeah. Danielle, do you want to talk about sort of how you've seen things change in like the space that you um, create in in the last few years and sort of where you, you've talked a lot about sort of where you hope to see things going, but um, if there's any sort of like concrete things. Good. Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously we've seen everything move to online. There's been a much larger interest in like platforms such as like Twitch or all these streaming platforms actually and how um, various institutions can kind of like jump on that bandwagon of um, keeping this audience online. I think something that's been very difficult was actually keeping an audience there. Um, the best concerts I've seen are like the Travis Scott one in Fortnite and uh, the Little Nas X in Roblox and a couple on VR headsets. Um, the only ones that have really worked in getting that feeling have actually been um, the ones in their VR headsets because of that kind of um, the actual having that 3D space and knowing when someone's closer to you, you can hear them when they're further away, you can't, so kind of, you get that kind of chatter. Um, but to be honest, I'm, I just, I think what I've seen is like a big push towards actually building infrastructure that can support this kind of stuff. Um, and a, a, like a, a larger look into like, I guess the theory of why people return to like a Twitch streamer. Like, why are they going to listen to or watch like Ninja every day? Um, and what's good about Ninja that makes people stay and how to get a different age demographics. Like why does Limmy, um, who's a Twitch streamer, have such a, like a broad age demographic of people? And why does Ninja's a demographic of people all really young or dreams, um, extremely young kids? And, um, and also like a look into those fan bases like as uh, I think Trevor mentioned, like you call it the beehive. <laughs> um, and recently one of the people that I watched called Dream was caught cheating on a Minecraft, a Minecraft speed run. And then his fans were saying he's not cheating. So they were just doxing everyone that said he was cheating. Um, <laughs> so it's like a really, I, I've just seen this really interesting kind of merge of these art spaces, really trying to get into these spaces that they don't understand, weren't designed for them um, and they never cared for until now. Um, but I think we'll definitely see more access. I just think accessibility is going to hit the roof because um, a lot of people have been saying, we've been asking for my lectures to be online. We've asked for these shows to be online. We've been asking for me to have an online version of the galleries. 
Um, and so I feel like we'll hit a, a, a bit where everyone might have the infrastructure to have two versions of the same thing, where you can have your live show, but also maybe a, a, a um, Fortnite version of it as well. It'll be really interesting to see how like concerts and gigs pick this up and see if like, I've seen so many good like mo gigs online that you can kind of look around the environment. And it'd be really interesting to see how they implement the liveness like with that as well. I think that's the thing that's maybe missing is that this live element of like performing live and actually maybe a mo someone in a mocap suit on an actual stage where there's also people there, how you can merge the two like digital and present at the same time. Yeah, I really like that. And I think you're right that like access is only going to get better to these things and these like technologies are like only going to get better. I remember like, I guess it was about five years ago now when Bjork, she did um, like a VR thing. And I remember I had a flatmate at the time who went to see it, who was like studying visual graphics and she was, everyone was kind of raving about it. And she was like, it was good, but it's just like not there yet. Like people are so used to having things in like HD and they're not like ready for this quite yet but she was like I'm so faithful that it will be there in a few years and now I feel like it, it, it's there and it's only going to sort of keep mm -hmm. going and I think that speaks to what you were saying before Danielle in like a few years everyone's going to be like that that was all trash we can do it a million times better um and I think that's really cool but it's also interesting that like now it feels like every digital thing has value like not just value in that people watch it but like you can sell it like it's an actual valuable thing. A vid the video file you place on YouTube now has value. And that's something that's completely changed before because now we have, I mean, we all have a bunch of images on our computer, but now half of those you might be able to make money from just by giving someone that image, which is a super interesting change. Yeah, I, I'm pretty like obsessed with like concepts of value and how they change and how it, it how value can be so subjective. Um, but I think you're, yeah, you're so right that digital things, uh, assets, and digital life in general is just getting more valuable and it will be super interesting to see where that goes. Um, Stacey, do you want to talk about your work? I know you like you sort of were saying how you were studying at OCAD and now you're in Berlin and I'd love to sort of hear more about your like what you've seen happen since you've been working in 3D and avatars and sort of where you would hope that things go. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I also kind of wanted to follow up on what Danielle was saying, um, because I work like the majority of my projects are with record labels and musicians. So it's been a very interesting year and a half for me because, yeah, like my work has really kind of been narrowing to music projects, especially during a pandemic. And I have like a, actually a very interesting ongoing project with DJ Hell because I did um, a music video for him in 2020 where we actually made um, an avatar of him, but then we put it on different bodies, including like very feminine bodies and masculine bodies. And it's a very kind of Berlin club fetish inspired video. But then uh, he really wanted to keep using this avatar. And now like we just keep evolving this avatar. Like we're like giving it new outfits and he uses it for his press photos. And um, we're also going to mint the actual avatar and uh, like turn that into an NFT. So it's really like everything really has value. And also like, yeah, we're also working on a project of how to use this avatar again in live performances, but maybe not so much in the, like a mocap suit because it has kind of been done and it does sometimes for me lack the, the live audience part. So we're trying to see how we can make it more abstract or do something else with it. But it's really like, I've never seen such method of like reusing something that I did for so many projects and kind of giving it a life of its own so I'm really enjoying this because it's also really getting me to learn new software and collaborate with different organizations who can you know technically make these projects come to life and yeah it's been really interesting and yeah I, I really do enjoy seeing how musicians have been finding ways to get their music and content out there and also fashion as well like I've been working with fashion quite a bit in the last year and I'm interested in sustainable fashion and digital design so it was also really fun for me to work with that and 
because of COVID, a lot of the shows and yeah, like fashion shows, of course, weren't really happening. So there's a lot of digital fashion shows, which were really fun because, you know, you really get to create outfits that couldn't even exist in the physical world, not yet anyway. And it's been really fun to kind of really push my work and like really take advantage of the fact that it's 3D because yeah, like as I said before, like, you know, you have this really powerful tool at your disposal and you can just make it so much larger than life. And I've really, really been enjoying seeing that. And also like the progress with augmented reality and, I just, I'm really excited to be honest. Uh, I think that like generally speaking, like I really see the internet as an extension of our mind in some ways. Like I think there isn't really like a big difference between the IRL and online. And I think that now uh, more and more artists are exploring this connection and seeing ways of how they can bring their digital creations into the physical world. So mm -hmm. I think that that's really great. That's something good that came out of this unfortunate situation in 2020 and this year but yeah that's what I've been noticing from um since I've been doing this yeah and again it's so interesting to think of this like reflexive nature I think people think about like bringing things online but then it's so interesting to think about like bringing digital things back into the physical whether that's like through a live show or um in any of and totally it's like magic almost you know like you have these <laughs> tools that don't exist anywhere else so you can create something completely unreal and then just somehow put it into yeah the IRL so it's really kind of the bridge between the two worlds is you know it's becoming a fine line <laughs> yeah um Trevor I guess uh where you see things going you know you I you said earlier, like uh, you see Brett as sort of being like a Disney or a Marvel, um, and and how do you how do you see things getting there? You know, do you, it feels like people are ready for it, but how do you how do you, how have you seen things how how have you seen things like get to this point, and how do you see them like becoming the next sort of like Disney or Marvel? Oh man, this is a, a great broad, broad question. Uh, I would say increasingly that things are kind of already getting there. Um, I, mean, I think about like augmented reality is kind of like already being uh, our reality. You know, whenever I'm driving in a car and Google Maps tells me like to turn right, like this is fucking bizarre. Like some just voice from above has like directed me and navigated me through my life. It's kind of this, this new invisible hand. Um, but beyond that, like young people are doing really impressive stuff. I mean, like I, I think some of the most inspiring things to me are happening on Roblox. You know, like, you know, nine, 10 year old young women creating these really impressive experiences. That's really cool to me. Uh, and then, you know, I think beyond that, kind of the more top down, you've seen folks at Epic um, with, with that good Fortnite money really invest in building tools for this emergent metaverse and, um, you know, kind of democratizing a lot of the tooling that you, a lot of us have, have been using or kind of trying to build. Uh, and so I think, you know, COVID accelerated all this stuff. We're now on a kind of really advanced timeline and people are recognizing that like the value they, they create in these virtual spaces can then translate into real world interactions, love, money, whatever it is, and that's compounding. And so I think uh, it's gonna be one of those things that happens slowly and then all of a sudden, and um, that, that curve is, is, is seemingly starting to take shape right now. Slowly and then all at once. I love that. I think that that is how, I feel like that's how time has passed for me in the last year at least. Um, but I'm interested to see the ways that that uh, like is reflected back onto like technology and industries and like for me and music. Um, but yeah, I guess I, unless any of you have any final thoughts, uh, I want to thank you all so much uh, for your time. This has been like a really enlightening conversation and uh, uh, it will be archived online and I hope that lots of people watch it because I've learned so much and uh, I think I'm I'm excited to see how people sort of use the ideas discussed here um, to, to make things happen. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you, Caitlin. Um, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your days, evenings, wherever you are. Um, but this thank has you. been uh Coco hosting the Music Futures and Simulacra panel. Uh, and yeah, a huge thanks to Music Board Berlin and the Ryerson Communication and Design Society for making this happen because we couldn't have done that without them. <laughs> um, but ciao, thanks everyone.